welcome back to the channel my name is Lawrence if this is your first time here I share and comment on events that are taking place both within and outside of the SDA church the last couple months of my pastoral life have been the most stressful that I've ever gone through and the last week the most disappointing few days ago I think two or three days ago Pastor Ron Kelly shared something in the pulpit that actually showed that things are not going on well for him in his ministry. Well, let's go ahead and listen to him. Let's listen to what he actually said in the pulpit last two or three days. But before we go ahead and listen to Pastor Ron Kelly, I would encourage you to subscribe to this channel if you have not, all right? And you know, there are some people that sometimes ask me, Lawrence, where can we get some of your shirts to buy? Like, your shirts are beautiful. Well, you know, these are African-made shirts, you know? And so, like, if you are interested, like, just send me an email okay so with that being said let's get right into the video and uh, listen to what pastor ron kelly has to say the last couple months of my pastoral life have been the most stressful that i've ever gone through and the last week the most disappointing i'm of good courage but i think i figured out preparing this sermon why for a few hours this week i wasn't because i had forgotten if you go on the attack, you should expect a counterattack. And how many months and chapters of success can this church have before the devil says, whoa, they're getting out of bounds. The spirit of justice and judgment have showed up there, according to Isaiah 28, to turn back the battle at the gates. God is actually doing that. They're no longer the ragtag bag of uh, Laodicean, uninterested, unmarshaled, unfocused, unrallied individuals they're actually doing something and it's making a difference if I was the devil and I saw almost 4,000 churches and schools in the North American division lining up to participate in Pentecost 2025 it's coming friends this next year is going to be an amazing year for this division if I saw the renewed emphasis on the Holy Spirit at the North American Division year-end meetings, and if I was the devil, and I was there for at least a day, and I saw it, and I was powerfully impressed, if I was the devil, I would be concerned. Come the month of October, set every weekend aside for this village church because Friday, Sabbath, and Sunday, there's going to be gospel preaching here telling the amazing truths that have been trusted to the Seventh-day Adventist church. But if I saw that, I'd be afraid. If I actually saw churches and schools attempting to wrest themselves from the grip of Laodiceanism, institutionalism, ceremonialism, formalism hollowism of expression and profession, I'd be concerned. I'd double my efforts down. But now let's get a bit more personal because the battle that I find myself in, which is limited in understanding, and I'm actually calling for a day of fasting and prayer for this Wednesday. I can't tell you what it is. I don't want you asking what it is. I hope you never have to know what it is. But I'm here to tell you, friends, the great controversy is on. With the reviving the right arm of the gospel coming up, if I saw two gifted physicians who were ministers as well, and they had dedicated themselves to the reconstituting of the medical missionary work for saving souls, if I saw this revival of life-giving, lifestyle gospel medicine taking off around the world and being nurtured, fueled, and trumpeted from the village church pulpit, I might get afraid too if I was the devil because it works. And if I care to look out here today, I can look at people who both served and were blessed by being in the last immersion program we did. We have people that are in the midst of Bible studies who got a little drink of the water of life and a broader understanding of the truth that shapes the times we live in. If I saw seven young professionals, scholars of the highest order, who desired to rebirth Adventist education, media, ministry, health ministry, working with and being mentored by other professionals, working with parents and students in a homeschool cooperative, I'd be afraid. 
I'd be afraid. If I saw youth ministry calling children to the sweet, simple happiness of childlike faith and devotion, filling their heads with decidedly Christian music, involved in Bible studies, with their hearts being won to spirit-filled leaders and, us, and the Lord their Savior who died for them on the cross, if I saw their lives being directed to devotion and service and I was the devil, I'd be alarmed. Because we've had a lot of worldly youth ministry in this church for the last two generations and it hasn't worked. So when you get something that's working, you might get afraid. If I saw a social media ministry that's taking the presentations of things like our recent Jesus and Holistic Sexuality Conference and publishing to the world the explanation and the evidence that you weren't born gay and you weren't born in the wrong body, I'd be a little bit nervous because that's been my latest uh, deception du jour. If I saw Coming Together Ministries in Romania with the Biblical Research Institute and all the division and union leaders, and then when it was done, invitation after invitation in a very secular continent was just opening up to them so they could go preach and teach and model the joy of a lifestyle of purity, I'd be horror-stricken because now there's young people employed by that ministry as well as more mature people, and it is making a difference. If I watch the rapid acquisition of Four acres, four houses, two buildings, a medical clinic across the street, property from the public school. If I saw the speed with which the resources were gathered and the unity with which the decisions were made, I'd be aghast if I was the devil because the church is becoming the church militant. It's actually doing what it was destined to do. Souls are being saved. Visions are being cast. Commitments are being made. If I saw an elementary school continuing with higher goals in whole person development for missionary service, I'd amount a renewed attack on their efforts. And if I saw students immersed more and more in the ennobling and refining elements of of nature, I'd be concerned. If I saw the dishonesty, the ignorance, and the fear built around the recent pandemic come crashing down in the daylight of transparency and free speech, restoring the credibility of various people and institutions, including this village church, I might be beside myself. Do you know there was a lady who worked for Blue Cross Blue Shield, just awarded $12 million on November 9th. There's 180 other people lined up in that same organization, and you can bet the lawyers are wringing their hands, thinking, what do we do? Do we appeal this, or do we just settle it and figure out how to settle with 180 other people from one company? Yes, it was good for Facebook to say they were sorry and colluded with the government. Yes, it was good for the New York State Supreme Court to say, give all of those government employees their job back with back pay. Yes, it was good for the Bay Area Regional Trans port system to award a million dollars to six people who lost their pay over their religious liberty exemptions being an eye. Yes, it's good for the secular government, like Paul said to those administrators, oh, excuse me, come right on over here, would you? Would you walk me out of town and let the world see that I wasn't wrong, I'm not a criminal? Yes, friends, that is good. And when credibility is restored to places where purity of principle freedom and power of the spirit to go against prevailing narratives. Yes, I'd be beside myself if the false narratives were falling down because the truth was rising out of the ashes. If I watched 150 churches built in El Salvador, an academy campus rehabilitated, hundreds of students saved from gangs and sent to school. If I saw a 30,000 square foot college about to open with hundreds and thousands of more people equipped and trained for gospel ministry, I would be furious because there's a reflex influence. And as soon as you start caring about people that can never do anything to help you, God says, open the windows. Because when you provide for the poor, God steps in and says, uh, I'm paying them back. Thank you. No, thank you. If I saw a million dollar church built in Montana, wells in India, food for Zambia, tens of thousands of aid in Ukraine, and similar local charities, I'd get mad. If I counted seven, soon to be eight, and then a ninth young missionary coming to dedicate one or two years of their life to this gospel cause, that would disconcert me because for years they had been chose choosing wealth and pleasure and prestige over being a teacher or a pastor. And of course, now there's a call to become a ministerial doctor. Because if that army of youth is actually starting to muster an army which could swell in ranks rapidly, this would especially disconcert me. If I saw the people becoming generous, pouring resources into the cause of God, if I actually saw the windows of heaven being opened, 
I'd be alarmed. If I recognized the promises made to Joshua that no one would be able to stand against their forward progress, that everywhere they stepped was becoming theirs and all they were doing was prospering, I'd be panicked. I had a minister make a joke the other day as he was looking for a house that he better do something quick because the village church was buying up everything. <laughs> Not true, but it's time that God's churches go forward. It's not time we just keep the narrative of normal going. It's time for a narrative of unnormal. If professionals, contractors, and businessmen and women were giving God their first and their best of their money, time, and talent, if business owners were weaponizing their businesses to advance God's cause, I'd tremble. If these business owners were discipling their believing employees and winning the hearts of their non adamus employees, if I saw people leaving their high-paying jobs to take low-paying jobs that were missional, I'd scramble to resist their efforts. If I could see the previous efforts to marginalize and silence voices of truth were giving away to tens of thousands of online subscribers, I'd get desperate. If I saw a new interest in apocalyptic preaching and teaching, and if I saw the growing fatigue with meaninglessness in the society and a call, a trumpet call to purposeful living being, being poured out of this church, I'd be afraid. And if I saw a congregation becoming the church militant instead of the church dysfunctional, I'd fight back. If I saw new leaders discipled, if I saw sweetness and harmony in the ranks of a large congregation, if they actually have the savor, the fragrance of life in their fellowship, not just the profession of doctrine, if intellectual religion was combining with true love and bondedness, I would despair because it's easy to taste and see that something's good. Yes, these last two months have been some of the most difficult of my ministerial career, and yet in the preparation for my sermon, some of the most encouraging. And the last week, the most disappointing week of my pastoral life. But I know that something good is about to happen because it's always the darkest before it's dawn. I have every reason to rejoice, so do you, and no reason to worry. God is on the throne, God is on the move, and God is a shield to those who walk uprightly. This church is His, it will progress all the way to the gates of hell, and they will give way in the name of Jesus. Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 4, we have this treasure in earthly vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We're troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. And as our associate pastor Tarek prayed in our staff meeting from Lamentations 3.26, it's good to wait in silence for the salvation of the Lord. Lord, continue to vindicate us through your presence, Psalm 17.2. And let them shout for joy and be glad that favor my righteous cause, Psalm 35. Yea, let them say continually, let the Lord be magnified, which has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. We have nothing to fear for the future unless we forget he holds the future and unless we take ourselves out of his hands. <laughs> let God arise, let his enemies be scattered. Yes, friends, like Jehoshaphat, let's set the... Uh, Let's set the power of praise in motion in front of the battle. Ellen White tells us he had discipled for many years. He could have fought in human strength, but he knew instead it needed to be the arm of the Lord that had gotten us the victory. And so, for those battles that are raging behind the scenes that most of you, I hope, never know about, and that those who know about it don't talk about, and that we all pray about, I have great confidence. And preparing this message was just what I needed. I woke up at 3.38 this morning, friends. I don't get as much rest on Sabbath as some people. I'm not complaining. But when I wake up with all these things on my mind, I know that God wants to strengthen me. And you know, he put me in the ministry to save me. <laughs> That's just the bottom line. <laughs> I'm a 60-year-old Irishman who through the lineage of my forefathers had various challenges and addictions. And he said, 
this young man has a work for me to do, and I'm going to save him by allowing him to stand right up there where the arrows are whistling by his ears, the spears, the bullets, whatever they are, the bombs are going. He, I'm going to put them, I'm going to put him right up there where he's got to stay completely dependent on me. I'm going to give him a chance to trumpet the glorious gospel message that God is going to win and that God's people are going to win with him. And this morning, whatever you're facing, I just want you to know something. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers them out of some of them. Thanks. I needed to hear that from you. It's for me. It's for you. Remember, it's always the darkest before dawn. Let's stand and sing our closing song. Okay, so Pastor Ron Kelly did not tell specifically what his problems are, but he made known to his congregation or to his members that things are not really well, right? Things are not well in his ministry. So if you are watching me right now and you are a member of the village church or you are a member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church worldwide, please pray for Pastor Ron Kelly. You know, ministry sometimes comes with challenges, but we do not fear because we know Christ is leading. Jesus is leading and uh, Jesus Christ promised us that he has overcome the world, so we should not be afraid of anything. Okay, now I want to read this Bible verse um, right now and it is found in Matthew chapter 10 verses 24 through to 26. Matthew chapter 10 verses 24 through to 26 and uh, the Bible says, A disciple is not above his teacher nor a servant above his master. It is enough for a disciple that he be like his teacher and a servant like his master. If they have called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more will they call those of his household? Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed, and hidden that will not be known. So Jesus Christ, when he came on this earth, he faced a lot of challenges. He faced challenges because of the work that he actually was doing. And so he told his disciples that, hey, you may also face the same challenges. If it was done to your master, it may be done to you. Okay, so, um, well, I think we should pray for one another. That is why I said, if you are a member of the village church, Please keep your pastor, Pastor Ron Kelly, in prayers every day. Okay? So, friends, as I said, every time I come here, I share with you what is taking place in the church and outside of the church. This is what Pastor Ron Kelly just shared some few days ago. And I decided to share with you so that you can also remember him in prayers. Okay? So, thanks for watching. My name is Lawrence. See you next time. God bless.